Hello to the world and the universe. Good morning to the friends in the US. Good afternoon to those in Africa and Europe and good evening to Oceania and Asia. We are excited to welcome you all here in this IAC special session where we intend to unleash the potential of artificial intelligence and machine learning into space. My name is Hilde Steenaert and I am with Space Application Services in Belgium. And this session is powered by our Space Access IceCube service in collaboration with the friends from IBM Space Tech. We believe that the adoption of artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques in space can result in important steps forward for a wide range of applications, opening new portals into what the future could look like. Throughout this special session, we will address AI in space from history and background, going through some of the current, <coughs> current and emerging um, <coughs> applications and then looking into visions for the future. For that, we have a great lineup of speakers. We will start with William Carbone, who leads business development for global automotive aerospace and defense industries at IBM. He will talk about aerospace industry point of view and address market dynamics and key opportunities which are relevant for the topic. Then Mr. Matthias Biniok, who leads the space tech division in Germany, was the lead architect for IBM Watson in the DACH region and is the project lead and AR architect of Project Simon on board the ISS. And he will talk about the current and emerging AI applications. Nicolas Clemencin, space system engineer of our IceCubes team, will talk about our IceCube's AI initiative and how our AI box can be used for several application fields on board the International Space Station. Naeem Altaf, who is the CTO for IBM Space Tech and runs an innovation lab in IBM, will address Space Tech and future applications. And the last one in the line of the speakers will be Andre Chapera, business developer in our IceCube's team with a particular focus on space economy. Andre will be talking about AI powered space exploration and visions for the future. However, we want this special, special session for sure not to be a lean back and listen only session, but we want it to be an interactive session as the scope is to issue a white paper on unleashing the potential of artificial intelligence and machine learning into space based on the results of this session. For that, <clears throat> there are two ways for you to interact through Slido. And for that, have a look at the slide here. If you have not yet opened Slido, now is your time. Either scan the QR code or open the Slido website at the bottom and put in hashtag IAC2020. Many of you probably know already how to do so. If not, here is your chance. You could do so either in a separate tab or screen or on your phone if you like. There you can put all of your questions during the session. You can both write your own question or weigh in on which other questions you want to have addressed during the Q&A session. Important, very important, is also to engage in our AI in Space survey. A list of intriguing questions has been prepared there for you, where you can never answer wrongly, but you can weigh in on some very relevant polls. The results of these poll survey will be the core of the white paper. So please do contribute with your vision and your opinion. And the survey is open for 30 minutes during this session. So go and find it now while listening to our speakers. So we will get started with William from IBM, who will give insight in the overall context of market dynamics and technology evolutions. William, over to you. Hello. Thank you, Hilde. Uh, my name is William. I represent the global aerospace and defense and automotive industries. And um, I'm here to talk about um, all the what's happening in, in the in the space uh, sector. So uh, you're probably aware, aware about uh, all the IBM pioneering contributions to the aerospace and defense industry that have made the history. I will just go quickly through three of them, the, the milestones of the space industry, which is the, the Apollo missions, uh, 
and that over 50 years ago uh, helped the men uh, get on the moon. Um, maybe not all of you know that, uh, for example, the Mars rovers, uh, with a partnership with NASA, uh, are having, um, had in 2003 already, uh, the uh, the processor that uh, had the, the, the probability the, the, the ability to withstand conditions so it was already a long time ago and uh, as we will see today later with matthias uh, the project simon which is also another milestone in the in the modern era of of space tech um, i would like to focus now on on what's happening in uh, in the uh, market dynamics part of the aerospace and defense industry. And I, we get this question asked a lot, like what will the market look like in 10 years? So with the COVID pandemic uh, that really radically changed the, the market outlook uh, for the aerospace and defense industry, um, we know that the size of aircraft, future commercial models, and the volume of defense budgets, really everything is under reconsideration during the global crisis. So uh, we have also another aspect, uh, and then we quickly drive you through seven of these uh, influencers of the market dynamics. Uh, we have also on the market consolidation part, the piece of uh, M&A, which is supposed to get more intense. Uh, with the COVID, um, we also have more uh, incredible pressure on the supply chain. And uh, many of these uh, will have to be saved to ensure continued aircraft deliveries. And we have seen how much um, the, the clients are, are challenged nowadays. Then we also have a look on production. Uh, on, on, at the forefront is operational improvement, and uh, the second is cost reduction. Uh, so we have uh, the introduction of industry, industry 4.0, and uh, aerospace and defense companies are beginning to explore its value, ranging from making products and devices interconnected to expedited time to delivery. So on, on the last part, we have also a very important point, which is the supply chain. Uh, which is in, uh, having a, an increasing complexity in logistics, longer lead times in shipping and delivery, more need for transparency, and a higher degree of visibility are really creating new sets of challenges for supply chains and, uh, and the need for location intelligence, which is a very important topic. On the other hand, we have uh, three more points that are equally important. For example, the regulatory environment, and sim simply there are several uh, holes in the re regulatory process that have led to significantly more rigorous regulatory environment that will ultimately make our sky safer, we, we hope. And, and then, of course, the data and um, leveraging on the exponential growth data, uh, it's creating both new opportunities and challenges. So we have also different uh, intelligent workflows and humanized experiences that we require skills and architecture to use data streaming from IoT, media and platforms in order to develop leading edge capabilities, as well as to gain new product leadership by really unleashing uh, the power of big data. And uh, last but not least, we have the technology evolution, which is a big topic today, and um, we will cover later with Naim and, and Matthias. Uh, we have uh, also the fact that the COVID-19 crisis um, uh, led companies that who could leverage on technology to accelerate cost reductions through automation to ensure business survival, and then also to position the business to succeed uh, in the next normal or in the new normal. Uh, there are three things that uh, we, we leverage on um, based on the disruptive forces that we've just seen. Um, we have three different dimensions in the challenges. We have the ecosystem, the enterprise, and the aftermarket. So as we mentioned, there are regulations. There is a new, um, just to mention one, the new space paradigm that has become very attractive to not, not only for the new and small companies, but also for the more traditional large system integrators. Um, then we have an aspect on enterprise with data-driven enterprises that are beginning to see the value coming from that and not being realized. So AI is among them and is being used to uncover insights that were previously unimaginable. And then the other part, the other pillar is the aftermarket with a third challenge, which is growing the top line revenue and marching through aftermarket uh, digital services. And um, that will enable, for example, OEMs and suppliers to layer unique um, knowledge and on top of data to deliver new revenue design side. So um, we have then the, the disruption and how do, what are the opportunities of when we, just, we address that for the disruption? So um, still in the ecosystem enterprise and aftermarket, uh, we propose to extend the value and collaboration via platforms. And that's because uh, new product platform, for example, and technology advancements are enabling continuous improvements or of design products and design processes. Then we see also the exploitation of data in order to optimize the business. 
And that also comes with universal connectivity in the AI, cybersecurity, which is not a choice anymore, and, uh, and industry 4.0, 4.0, that is also a big uh, step forward. And then um, there is also the need for defining the strategy in order to develop digital solutions, for example, using cognitive capabilities to serve technical complex safety, critical and multi-system projects. And here is what we can do uh, actually to um, organize to, for client success. And uh, this is our, our um, team offering uh, with, with uh, a set of teams and, uh, and solutions. So uh, these are reflected into um, transform products, operations, and aftermarket. And there is a sub uh, um, part with uh, technology offerings, which spans from hybrid cloud and Red Hat, AI, blockchain, IoT, cloud edge, and 5G, quantum, and, and security. And of course, it's supported by a wide range of teams uh, spanning from research to the uh, and the industry. Thank you. Thank you, William, for those insights. Next, we will pass on to Matthias on AI in space, current and emerging AI applications. Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hilde. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about what artificial intelligence and machine learning based on data science is actually doing in uh, the future of, uh, of space. So let's have a look at that. The, uh, I have a few use cases. Um, one of them is the most common one, I would say, it's anomaly detection. We want to detect anomalies, for example, void outages, uh, in order to avoid, of course, payload loss. Um, one key point there is to reduce the false positive alerts, um, because that takes a lot of time, and time is very precious. Um, and therefore, uh, also one of the key insights here is that with anomaly detection, you understand your data better, you understand what's actually happening in your, uh, in your satellites or in your sensors, for example. Um, you can see that there are many ways how to do that. You can use auto machine learning, auto AI mechanisms, uh, time series analysis is one of the key points that is being used in anomaly detection. And of course, streams processing is also very important if you talk about anomaly detection. In addition, another uh, use case where we see AI uh, is getting infused is operator support. Operators have uh, don't, don't have a lot of time, of course. Uh, they need to automate as many tasks as possible. They need to reduce the time for troubleshooting, and therefore they need to look into large amounts of documentation, for example, or into uh, manuals. And the best w uh, thing would be if an AI would actually recommend the next best action or even do that uh, by, uh, by himself. So that's something that operators uh, need, to, uh, need to have some uh, support with. Um, you can do that with, for example, uh, in the, I, uh, in the uh, IAM uh, process, you can actually use, for example, engineering advisor for that. And uh, yeah, that's, that's one key point. Uh, another point is that you can also infuse the operation itself with AI, for example, for identifying problems, to resolve it automatically if possible, assign incidents automatically, and also uh, understand and uh, enhance the diagnose process in uh, this very complex environment. So AI and operation is really a big topic. Another topic that's uh, very important is geo-observation. Most of you already know it, of course, like monitoring infrastructure. That's not something that is new. But with deep learning, you can now do something uh, in, in more depth. You can actually say, OK, I want to detect specific trees that are growing too close to uh, a power line, for example. You can use object detection for identification of uh, any uh, buildings, for example. Um, I've, I've brought you one example uh, where we have a tornado. You can see it on a normal map, right? But if you look deeper into the data, you can actually see that uh, there is uh, there's enough data available that you can see the impact of a tornado using uh, object detection and, and deep learning and computer vision. So geo-observation, another uh, important AI use case. And then last but not least, I uh, wanted to talk about Uh, built by Airbus Defense and Space, by the German Space Agency and, uh, and IBM. 
And Simon's tasks are to fulfill experiments on the International Space Station. So our overall goal is to create kind of a real crewmate for astronauts that they can work with, a system that is supporting the astronauts in their daily job. Um, for example, Simon can, can also act as a mobile video camera for documenting experiments that are going on on the ISS and, and many more uh, tasks. So this is kind of uh, one glimpse into the future what AI for astronaut support can bring. The current state of assignment is uh, is very interesting. Um, we launched the first version with SpaceX CRS15 uh, in 2018. We did our final testing, commissioning. Uh, we even have a second version of Simon. Simon 2 launched in uh, in December 2019, and we had our experiments in February this year, right before COVID. Uh, so uh, this is this is something. Uh, where we are continuously uh, improving our capabilities in AI and space with Simon, with Airbus and the German Space Agency. Um, looking into the future, what are uh, deep space missions uh, talking about when we are talking about astronaut uh, uh, assistance in space? So uh, what we are planning, of course, we want to uh, have Simon on a deep space mission. But as you uh, might think or might know, if we are going to the lunar gateway, if we're going to the moon, if we're going to the Mars, then we are actually also uh, uh, ha need to have an AI assistant for the astronauts, not only for the astronauts, but maybe also for the missions. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Matthias. Excellent. Nicola, I would pass now the floor to you to talk about our own IceCubes AI initiative. And I think we are not hearing you, at least I am not. Are you hearing me? Yes. yes, now I hear you well. Sorry. So I'm going to briefly, uh, as I was saying, I'm going to briefly introduce what we at IceCubes um, are planning regarding AI and uh, machine learning. Um, so we are not uh, at IceCubes AI ML specialists. We are a commercial service to provide access to space. Uh, we have in the past years designed and built a facility, which is called the IceCubes facility. That's our name, uh, which is now in the International Space Station in the Columbus module. And this facility allows us to accommodate what we call experiment cubes, uh, which are basically any payload that our customers might want to send to space. Uh, we call them cubes because these payloads generally have a cube-like uh, shape of 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, so calc on the CubeSat uh, form factor, or a multiple of that for experiments that need a, a, a bigger volume. Um, and thanks to the IceCube facility and our network infrastructure, um, our service provides electrical power to the experiment cubes and real-time internet connection. So that means that, in short, when a payload is sent to space and plugged to the facility, we can turn it on, and then we have uh, full access to it via TCP IP uh, from anywhere in the world, and 24-7 real-time connectivity. Uh, for instance, payloads are built with uh, embedded onboard computers like Raspberry Pi or, or, or whatever else. Um, they can simply be accessed uh, via a VPN connection and controlled via SSH protocol. Uh, so that opens the door to a lot of possibilities and ideas, and the AI box is one of them. Um, as briefly mentioned, uh, previously, uh, there's a lot of possibilities for AI uh, in space. And uh, we think that AI and machine learning is underused at the moment in the ISS, and we think there's a lot of things that can be done with it. So our position with our facility now, uh, currently in orbit, allows us to lay a first useful brick to bring more um, AI and ML development and applications to the ISS. Uh, so the idea, uh, is to send a, an experiment cube, um, which would be um, uh, running some computer hardware designed to run AI and ML applications. Uh, and the idea is that we would leave that cube inside our facility as a mini uh, AI machine learning server, in a way. Uh, so thanks to uh, multiple connectivity options which are offered by our facility, the server could be uh, intrinsically connected to other experiment cubes or uh, devices which would be outside the facility. Uh, so as you can see, we have Wi-Fi connection. We have, of course, a cable connection to any of the other cubes which will be connected to the facility. Um, so the idea is to offer as a service the user of this AI box for a certain time. And companies and people um, uh, interested in testing AI ML applications um, could uh, could run their applications on the cube uh, and test it in real uh, space conditions, uh, since the cube would be on board the ISS. So uh, hardware-wise. 
um, the uh, AI box is built around um, a uh, it's built around a NVIDIA JSON Xavier NX, um, which is one of the latest MIDI computers for edge computing developing by the company uh, NVIDIA. Um, so this is a tiny computer that we can easily fit in an experiment uh, cube and send to space. And uh, as all these computers are, it's very good at running AI ML applications. That's what it has been designed for. Uh, it is not a very complicated uh, computer specifically designed for space applications. Uh, it's, a, it's a commercial off-the-shelf item, very easy to use, designed to run in, in, you know, in, in, a, in an indoor environment. Uh, that makes it uh, very, very accessible, uh, very cheap uh, to, to launch and operate uh, even from space. And we think that, uh, that this is a, a way to, a good, to have, find a good compromise to offer a simple and affordable uh, commercial service, which is crucial when we want to trigger a wider use of AI and machine learning uh, in the short term. Uh, so now I'm going to go quickly through some examples of uh, applications uh, that uh, this AI box could be used for. Um, so uh, some of them have already been uh, already been mentioned by uh, by previous speakers. Um, so smart assistants like the Simon um, for astronauts it can be either fully uh, robotic or fully uh, software. Uh, like we have nowadays smart assistants in our smartphones in our computers, we could think of um, of a smart assistant running on tablets or, or uh, uh, laptop computers for astronauts uh, with uh, the, let's say the AI uh, algorithms running on the AI box and just. Uh, receiving inputs and sending outputs. Um, in the same way, we could use the AI box uh, as a, a, a device to process medical data. Uh, more and more uh, AI applications are now um, uh, running uh, when it comes to the medical field to analyze uh, health data from, from, from patients on, on ground in hospitals. And we think it would be a good idea to bring that to space. Um, you can basically provide real-time diagnostics in the same way as you can do on hardware and software, which is another application. You can run on human beings and uh, try to predict, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, cure that might be required for certain uh, diseases or symptoms uh, that you can see through pattern in the data. In the same way, you can do image analysis, as it was previously described, uh, using computer vision with cameras. Uh, you can uh, try to use the, uh, the images coming from the cameras to get uh, useful data out of it. Uh, there's many other applications. Uh, I could speak for hours about all of those, um, but the point is that we our uh, users uh, to use their creativity to make that list bigger. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola. Great short overview. A quick reminder for folks who may have come in after the start that you should be connecting to Slido. Um, to answer the survey polls that you can find there. Again, there are no wrong answers, but the results with your opinion and your vision will be the core of a resulting white paper on AI in space. So don't miss that chance. You can also post all your questions as many of you are already doing on AI in space also in Slido. Then we will move on and I will happily pass the mic uh, to Naeem in the US, very early Naeem, on space tech and future applications. Naeem, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Eldi. Uh, it's an absolute uh, pleasure and honor to be here on this ISC forum. <clears throat> good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. As uh, IBM's uh, distinguished engineer and CTO for space tech, I lead the innovation group. So I would like to briefly discuss few technologies which will shape the future of the space exploration. All right. So we're here just to give you a quick overview, looking at the uh, global space economy. It's in the next two decades, it's uh, above a trillion dollar industry. And looking at the landscape in the space, we have seen the uh, public-private partnerships between NASA and the, and the SpaceX, the Artemis program coming up, and the uh, commercialization and the human humans going to the uh, space station as the uh, private for space tourism. Then we also have these private commercial launchers, you know, SpaceX, Rocket Lab, and um, emerging, and then mega constellation, Starlink, Tel Telestat, and there are more coming in this space. So looking at the use cases in four uh, broader areas, one being the blockchain, so, for example, the uh, space cargo, 
space asset management, manufacturing, maintenance, configuration, space traffic management. So the basic idea is, you know, behind the blockchain is to provide the prominence and the auditability of all the uh, complexities behind the uh, logistics of these uh, different kinds of uh, things I've listed here. Then another one is a digital twin for the future as we look towards the Artemis program for the lunar gateways, landers, rovers, satellites. And this is because of the sensors and the networks we have available today on the ground. We can create digital twins of the uh, objects in space. Then edge computing, which is uh, you know basically doing the all the satellites which are doing Earth observation data and doing analysis. And even there are companies who are thinking about putting data centers in the in the low Earth orbit. And last but not least, the uh, quantum computing and looking at uh, you know. So use cases here like the space collision avoidance or the uh, space trajectory optimization. So we'll go into more details in, in these. So, so here's a, just a quick overview of you know, uh, looking at uh, use cases for satellite manufacturing, space cargo launch. It's a, you, can, uh, you can imagine how complex the logistics are all the way from where you put the orders in to let's say a satellite manufacturer who have suppliers, subsystem contractors, then from there, you have the launch services provider, then the mission control center, and finally the satellite operations. But in between, you have all the contract signing, the purchase order, design specs, testing of all this equipment happening, and then the, all the different operational specs. And then you have the regulatory authorities involved, the insurance companies. So you can imagine how complex this, uh, this you know, the logistics can be for getting to space. And this is where the, the, the blockchain can really help in uh, digitizing all the elements in between and providing the prominence and auditing capabilities. So another use case here is the space traffic management data exchange. So uh, as we are seeing, uh, you know, in just past 50, 60 years, we had close to 9,000 launches and or objects in, in the orbit and 5,000 of them are active today. But now with these all mega constellations going up, we are talking about 30 to 40,000 of these satellites in next three to five years by different companies. So it's very important that we monitor and we know what's in the orbit and different agencies in the world are tracking through their radars or telescopes. And the idea here is that how we bring all the information together through data exchange backed by a blockchain technology and provide the data curation on top of it. So you can have a, so you can get your best answer from, you know, what's in the orbit, what are the you know, paths of these uh, different kinds of objects in the, in the orbit, because that's very important as we plan to launch more uh, satellites and spacecrafts into the space. The next use case is the is the edge computing in space. So data is being produced by these satellites, as we know, for mostly for the Earth observation. And from, you know, we're looking at different uh, deep learning, uh, convolutional net neural networks and other techniques that can play a huge role in analyzing this data. For example, in case of a natural disaster, right? How can we locate an assets that, so the extent of the damage to a given building by automating the analysis of imagery and help these government agencies and the first responders to expedite relief to these areas. And if we have noticed in last just uh, six or 12 months, the fires in Australia and California, and then from these Earth observation satellites watching the human mobility patterns and predicting the, the future urban planning and challenges. So the goal here is, you know, as this data is being produced, what can be done right on the satellite? also the edge computing in space. And then for example, you probably have heard that most of the Earth observation which happens, 70 to 80% of the, the imagery, it, it's a cloud covered on the, on the planet, right? So how can we filter out those images right on the satellite and then uh, provide only, downlink only the images which are of useful or the data which, is, which can provide some insights. The next uh, use case over here is the space situational awareness. This is a very hot topic. I mean, this is an umbrella of where we talk about space debris, space traffic management. So just three or four weeks ago, the International Space Station had to maneuver. That was a third maneuver just this year alone. 
and because there was some upper stage from a previous rocket which was coming in its path and they and the astronauts had to go into the rescue mode you know to get out of do all the operations right to get out of or eject from uh ISS. It's, uh, you can imagine it's a very, very costly operation. So we just open sourced a project. Uh, you can see the link below. Basically, the idea here is the space mission readiness. Our approach is to improve the orbits prediction using machine learning methods. We are not predicting the orbits per se, but we are creating models which can find the errors in which are inc incorrectly predicted for the objects uh, for the future location. So we have like two types of baseline models. One is a physical baseline model for predicting orbits. The second one is the machine learning model that is trained to predict the errors in this physical model. And based on this uh, application, we have put the conjunction search or, as well. So you can go and if you click on spaceorbits.net, you can go and click on your objects and say which of the two will come close to each other within, let's say, 5,000 miles or something. Thank you, Naim. Very interesting. Uh, we'll transition to the last speaker, Andre, who will bring insights or ask questions rather on AI powered space exploration and visions for the futures. Andre, to you. Thank you. Can you hear me well? All right. So, well, a lot of questions, uh, uh, very few answers, or close to no answers. So, now that we've seen some of the current and emerging applications for AI in space, I'd like to invite you to reflect upon some of these big themes and, and uh, questions uh, out there. And we try to capture some of them in our survey. So I hope you're filling in survey. So hurry up. And um, these are just some of the, the trends that we are witnessing, some of the, the, the themes and the trends that are picking up speed, gaining momentum. So we're talking about disruptive um, uh, technologies and uh, emerging, em emerging commercial markets in space and uh, democratization of space technologies and new players joining the game and public-private partnerships for space exploration. So um, if we do this right and, and ride this wave in a sustainable manner, this could be the dawn of a new era. So what would Industry 5.0 look like and Space 5.0? And at what stage would we call ourselves uh, um, Humankind 2.0? Um, so, the past 30 years have brought tremendous technological changes and one can only speculate on what the next 30 years might look like. Um, our intelligent space machines would fulfill various roles and we could group most of these applications under three categories or let's say three dimensions. So there's exploration for, well, for exploration and, and knowledge and uh, answers and research. Uh, also exploitation in order to become self-reliant and sustainable in, in the outer space, providing the foundation and infrastructure for exploration. And then observation, which is still exploration, but let's say in a, in a passive, in a more passive mode, if we build, uh, for example, the, um, uh, the required infrastructure for um, uh, astronomy and a better understanding of the universe uh, on the far side of the moon. So we would have uh, the adventure type of AI, the industrialist type of AI, and the let's say the philosopher type of AI that is um, contemplating the, the secrets of the universe on the on the far side of the moon. So just just a few, uh, I would like to take you 30 years into the future. Of course, we cannot predict the future. We can, we can dream about it and we can make it happen. And um, what would space exploration um, look like in 30 years from now um, using all, all these capabilities and exponential technologies? So, um, uh, we could envision a, a wide range of automated um, uh, or AI-assisted activities, uh, either through human-machine uh, partnerships or simply fully robotic. So um, basically, um, and also human-machine or brain-computer interfaces for space flight, um, uh, AI probes that are um, uh, scanning and exploring the solar system. Um, Unprecedented, uh, unprecedented amounts of data would be generated in this uh, in this adventure, in this search. And uh, maybe we could even see the first uh, AI colonies or communities or swarm collective intelligences in, in, in space. How would they look like? We don't really know. When it comes to the space economy, we, we come up with these projections. So it might be around two or three uh, trillion uh, which is still uh, less than some industries nowadays. So we can dream of a, of a, a vibrant cis-lunar econosphere that would be um, 
sustained by an ever expanding industrial infrastructure farther and farther into into the solar system and um, we could uh, already we are already working on um, uh, as a civilization we're working on various uh, automated industrial uh, activities so we could even think of uh, automated interplanetary space liners and freighter networks so that that support trade routes and um, uh, swarms of uh, probes that uh, prospect constantly so there's a, a long list of of um, applications we could think of and well it goes without saying that uh, there's a long list of of implications and uh, we're not gonna um we cannot even scratch the surface so from a technological point of view um harsh challenging environments always require technological innovation and from a scientific point of view ai powered space exploration might offer us new perspectives a new understanding of life and its origins and um, answers to questions we haven't even answered yet we haven't even sorry asked yet um from an institutional or political point of view so what kind of uh, institutions and communities will we export into outer space and uh, um, you know who will be the next uh, space superpowers or um, AI superpowers and at what point do we grant our robotic uh, envoys the rights and the recognition they they deserve and do we need an outer space for non-biological decision makers so long list of, of uh, implications and also there the more subtle or nuanced implications like ethical and philosophical and existential so um well all related to the freedom given to ai in space and on earth and all and related to our place in in the universe in this vast um, uh universe so uh well unfortunately time is uh, uh running out so uh, uh there's plenty of uh, food for thought and um uh well before i wrap up i i would like to to leave you with some, in some good company so um just a few examples of uh, ai from uh, from science fiction of ai for space in space and uh well they are fictional but uh, they seem very real to to many of us so uh well let's uh, build an exciting uh, future together in space thank you thank you andre my mind boggles so let's um, make time for a couple of questions and to have a glimpse at the first results of our survey. So let's pass to Slido and I'll shoot immediately one of the first questions. And um, the question is, AI algorithms are often referred to as black boxes. Could you suggest, suggest some strategies to convince human managers and teams to trust an AI-based tool and fully integrate it within their process? Matthias, would you attempt a shot at this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, the the question about AI as black boxes is uh, is definitely valid. Um, the 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 question behind it is okay. How can we explain outcomes of the of the AI models that we train? How can we ensure that we can trust the models and uh, that we can actually look into them? That we have a kind of a transparency. Um, there are some machine learning algorithms that are actually explainable. You know? For example, decision trees uh, or decision tree like models are quite explainable. You can basically open the black box. Um, but if you're using deep learning, it's more difficult. Uh, there are various ways to understand them. Like, uh, for example, you can visualize them. You can track the, uh, the processes. Uh, you can, there's a lot of research going on also to open the black box. And there are already algorithms to explain these models. So for example, uh, using LIME or contrastive explanations, those are techniques that are being used to open the AI black box. And uh, the the question uh, uh, the questionnaire is totally right. We need to open the black box. We need to understand what is happening. We need to be able to rely on these models. We don't necessarily need to understand everything, but we need to rely on them, and we need to know that what that the outcomes of the models are always at least explainable and understandable for us and that we can trust them. That's the key behind trust and transparency in AI. Very nice, intriguing. Thank you, Matthias. The next question from Dominic in Germany. Hi, Dominic. In, uh, the question is, in space, redundancy is important. So if two AI are running hot redundant, which one will take decisions? Maybe Naim? Naima, I'm not hearing you. 
Sorry about that. No, thank you. Can you hear me now, Heldi? Yes. Thank you. Now, that's a great question. It's a little bit tricky here because uh, it depends upon where the AI, the, this engine is running for whatever kind of decision it's making. So you probably will have to have a master which takes control of which one will take precedence based on the history of that AI, how the results are coming through that engine. So there has to be some sort of a, like a supervisor on top of these two AI decision engines, which can take tell based on the history, which will, will take the decisions. OK, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and maybe I'll pass it to um, Andre. Um, Andre, uh, an ethical uh, question. So how can certain ethical guidelines, such as Asimov's laws, or an extension of such be implemented and interpreted by a machine learning or AI? And are there examples of applications of such guidelines in current operation? And should there be? Well, yeah, that's a really, that's a tough one. And it's probably one of the most uh, elusive ones. So, um, I mean, this is, uh, this is not just a, a, a question of uh, programming. It's not just a technological matter. This is also a philosophical matter that we also need to address. I mean, what kind of, uh, what are we actually, do? can we agree on a set of principles that are universal and that, uh, you know, they represent our, our search for, um, uh, for, well, for knowledge and for, yeah, can we come up with a basic set of rules to to regulate uh, the, these machines that would be the create our creation? So, from an ethical point of view, I mean, it will take a, a super team of of uh, philosophers and then thinkers to to come up with uh, something uh, that which is you know uh, an approximation of some common ground. So, um, yeah, these are open questions. I'm 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 very interested in knowing more about these. It is obviously an intriguing uh, topic, AI in space, and we can see that also from the amount of questions and uh, the amount of questions we will not be able to uh, answer now. However, we will follow all of these questions and include them in the white paper. So I want to say thank you to the speakers and to the active contributors. And I want to say thank you to all of you that have completed the survey. It looks like that might be close to 100 people already. So the results of the survey and the white paper on the topic will be made available to you. Um, this special session is also set up to boost um, <clears throat> an AI in space community. So if you want to be an active part of this community and or receive the white paper and the survey results, don't hesitate to send us an email to the IceCubes mail address on the top um, for this scope. Uh, and please stay connected with an AI in space community to create a visionary future and answer to all of those questions that are very intriguing. Thank you to the audience for tuning in and thank you for IEC for this special session. Bye to all.